Hello everyone, welcome back to the barn. Happy Saturday. It is a uh, Saturday night here. I am uh, I'm out here again. I really want to get this behind me and done. So a little more setup work out here in the barn. Hopefully this time I will be done with all setup for real. I can get back to other things. <laughs> so for those of you who've been asking about What's going on with the house? Well, sitting over here on this pallet is all the stock for the face frames, door, styles and rails, and drawer fronts for all the cabinets. There's the stove. <laughs> There's the range hood. And then the flooring. <laughs> it's still sitting back here. So I really want to be uh, done with all this out here so that I can mentally be done with this so I can actually move forward and uh, work on the house. So today, uh, a little more setup work here, kind of in this kind of zone back here, getting the chair kit stuff set up and finalized and done. And uh, I will once again be answering some questions from the last video and, and whatnot, and maybe, you know, continuing to offer my hot takes on things. <laughs> let's, let's go. So as a refresher from last time, I have this area back here in mind for my packing area for the chair kits. So I got my packing tables, I'll have my boxing station, my hardware station, and the last little bit of inventory management for my most popular chairs, which will be on more pallets and stuff. So this pallet rack here is gonna be replaced with this pallet rack here, which is taller. I got some more beams so I can have more shelves. And uh, you know, I'll clean up the rest of the area here behind the forklift. And hopefully this will be a uh, fully functional space. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get started. Here we go. So I thought a good start to the questions today would be just to answer kind of one question that I saw a few times, and that's what exactly am I shipping from here, or what am I using the space for, and apologies on this one. I always forget that there are always new folks that maybe seeing these videos for the first time or maybe not following as close as they have been around for as long or what have you. So they might not have the whole backstory. So the barn is a replacement for the warehouse, the commercial space that I had been leasing for uh, a bit over two years. And that is the space where my physical products live. So that would be primarily my chair kits, my workbench kits and uh, my slabs and lumber sales. So the barn will be used for that same purpose and as a bit of an accessory to the rest of my life to be able to store and hold some of the other things that I have. And that kind of goes to another question. Uh, am I gonna move my woodworking shop out here from the garage? And I don't plan to. So the garage shop, that is essentially the home of the digital products business and the barn is the home of the physical products business. There is of course a little bit of overlap here and there, but for the most part, the two kind of umbrellas of the business can stay out of each other's way, which makes things far more efficient and just easier for me. So that kind of leads me into this question here from TI Design. How did I determine that chair kits were a business to pursue? Did you do some market evaluation or somehow realize the needs people have? I know you also do workbenches and wood slabs, but why not cutting boards or something else? So this is a great question. And if you've, uh, you've been around for a long time, I actually started with cutting boards. So before I was making videos, I was making cutting boards and selling them. I started doing cutting boards in uh, 2010 and I kind of, uh, let's say retired from cutting boards in 2015. So that's actually how I got my start as far as growing my business or growing at that time my hobby. Uh, all the cutting boards I made, I put back into my hobby, which became my business and allowed me to, you know, buy more equipment, buy more materials. So actually all the cutting boards that I, uh, I sold back then, all that revenue went back into the business, what actually became the business and is a foundation of where I am today, which is kind of weird to, uh, to think about. So as far as determining the, like the business feasibility of things, I take the, uh, I don't think the most expensive approach to it and try it and see if it works. <laughs> it's, uh, you get the best answer, but it takes you the most amount of time and money. So I'll touch on the chair kits first. If you haven't seen them, I'll put a little video here on screen of 
kind of what it is. It is a sort of ready to be assembled chair that you can customize and finish in your shop. So it is at the point of the project where all the joinery is cut, the curves are cut, all of everything is kind of ready to be dry fit. And at this point, the design can be modified or it can be assembled as is. So you're in control of if you want to add some sort of differentiating factor to the chair or if you want to do a different edge treatment. I've seen a lot of different customizations on these. Some people may want to do a little bit different shape on the crest rails, so that might be you know, cut to a different shape or different profile. The back slats can be you know, tapered or cut, or I've seen designs cut into them. Uh, I've seen banding installed into the rails. So there's a lot of different things you can do with these to kind of make them your own, so to speak. So this one came about from just the thought of seeing everybody making tables and not a whole lot of people make the chairs to go with them. And that is like two different categories. There's the hobbyist making a dining set for their own home and there is the semi-professional or professional uh, woodworker making a table on commission. And with those people, there are, I guess, two different uh, mindsets that I had in mind for this. So the first off is maybe more for the hobbyist who has never built a chair and sees that as a very intimidating process because the, like at least most designs, they're gonna have angled joinery, they're gonna have curves, nothing is really square. So it is a very intimidating project to approach. But if you actually have all the parts for the chair sitting in front of you and you put one together, you can kind of see how it all comes together. That really helps to demystify the whole process and helps you learn and maybe try new things in the future. So for that group, it's a great way to introduce chair making to someone who may be intimidated by that type of project. Another kind of group of people in there would be the people that understand how it all works, but uh, have no interest in making chairs because the difference with making chairs versus another piece of furniture is that with a piece of furniture you're just making a one piece of furniture and you know everything's happy with chairs you're not usually just making this one chair you're making like four five six eight ten uh, chairs so the number of parts becomes uh, quite large very quickly and with all these parts being you know angled and curved there's a lot of jigs that go into setting up your process before you even start cutting wood so for that category, people that really understand it and have no interest in it because they understand the amount of work required just to get to the point of having something to dry assemble. Now on the other side of things, the semi-professional and professional uh, woodworkers that are doing commission pieces, a lot of those folks are making commission tables, but rarely are they offering a set of chairs to go with that table. They're sending their customer somewhere else to buy chairs. So I thought another category of customers for this product would be those type of people. They can assemble the chair kits and sell them to the customer, thereby increasing the revenue they get from that customer and being able to offer a complete package to the customer as well. And that's sort of the background for uh, chair kits. The other sort of bigger one that I introduced and I'm still kind of working through is the workbench kits. That one you can thank Andy Klein for. <laughs> he, uh, he approached me a few years ago, or like, I don't know, five, six years ago, whenever he still lived uh, in Minnesota, and he asked about a quarter sun workbench top. I wasn't quite sure that it would be all that feasible or practical to do that, because you do need a pretty large log to do so. So I kept that one in the back of my head for a while. And then when I was ready to start, I found some very large silver maple logs and figured I could try and figure out how to make this into a workbench type business type thing. So that's actually why I bought the skid steer. That was the original reason for that because I knew if I was doing production sawing, moving these big chunks of wood, trying to position them to be quarter sawn, I couldn't do that manually. So that was the main reason I bought that thing, a uh, small investment and a product idea. And the workbenches is also why I bought the slab surfacer. The number of requests I've had for uh, surfaced workbenches has been quite great and you've seen a few of my experiments trying to do it the more um, let's say normal way with the machines in a normal let's say hobby shop and I can't do it efficiently so the surfacer will allow me to surface workbench kits and do a few other little products that I have that go along with uh, workbench kits. And I thought I'd touch on one last product that uh, didn't quite make it or has been shelved I guess and that is slab skins. So I started experimenting with that several years ago. The product completely works as far as like a proof of concept goes. You can cut those slabs really thin. We can dry them really flat. They can be veneered and laminated to whatever substrate you want. 
and turned into, you know, whatever, a thick edge table or uh, we did a door, uh, a mantle. We can do, you can do all kinds of things with it. The problem is that I didn't find it to be all that commercially viable. So the price point on a single skin would have to be, you know, several hundred dollars. It'd be kind of approaching the same price as like a full thickness slab anyway. So that one kind of shelved. It might come back in the future, but um, just an example of some of it, just, it's, not, it's not quite there yet. So that's a little background on the products businesses. Thank you for the question. Next question is from Tom. Thank you for the question, Tom. What piece of equipment do you think is most versatile to begin with? I mean, if you could only have one, the telehandler, if so, how big? There are some great smaller ones. So I think as always with equipment, and I guess with most things in life, it really depends on what you are doing. For me, the most versatile piece of equipment that I have is the mini skid steer. That thing can do quite a bit. It is very small and very nimble. It can get into a lot of places that other machines can't. Obviously it has the disadvantages that the other two machines I have kind of take up. And I think I'm able to show that in kind of the work that I'm doing where I have the mini skid steer, the telehandler, and the forklift, and they all excel at their own individual things. Essentially, they fill the gaps where the other ones fall short. So the mini skid steer has the disadvantage of not having a whole lot of lift capacity, you know, around a thousand pounds. For most things, going around doing stuff, that's all I really need. But when I start getting into bigger stacks of wood, or whole logs, whole bigger logs, then I need a little more capacity. So if that's gonna be outside driving around, that's gonna be the telehandler. That thing can pick up anything I have here. If it's gonna be in the barn, it'll be the forklift because it is smaller than the telehandler and far more maneuverable. The forklift has a rated lifting capacity of 7,000 pounds and it's about 10 feet long without the forks. The telehandler has a rated lift capacity of 9,000 pounds and is 20 feet long without the forks. Now obviously both machines will lift more than that depending on the load configuration and there's you know, some safety margin there from the manufacturer. But inside of a building, the forklift can go places the telehandler can't. So back to the skid steer, the other small disadvantage there is gonna be lift height. The highest that thing can lift is about seven feet. So it's okay for setting things on like the bottom shelf of a rack, but if you wanna put something 14 feet in the air, that's where the forklift comes in. If you need even more lift height than that, uh, the telehandler can do that. That can go to 42 feet, but it can't really do that inside of a building because it's too big. So there are a lot of smaller telehandlers that are a little more forklift sized. I think those are definitely a great option if you're looking to combine a forklift and a telehandler, which technically a telehandler is a forklift, but I digress. <laughs> I think you still have to look at the overall size and maneuverability. I haven't really compared the smaller telehandlers, like the 5,000 pound telehandlers, to like a forklift, but I'm guessing they're probably bigger. And although telehandlers are maneuverable, they're not as maneuverable as forklifts. They can't quite turn uh, on a dime, so to speak. So you need to take into account that turning radius of the machine and just the overall size and length of it, depending on where you wanna get your material to. So really, if I could only have one, it would be the skid steer, because I use that thing the most. I have ways I can get things done with it if I need to. If I need to move an entire stack of wood, I would just split the stack into like three or four sections and then stack and reassemble. It would be more work, but I can get it done. And I know I only focused on material handling in this because that's the majority of what I do. But of course the skid steer has all the other attachments that make it even more uh, useful and versatile for me at least. So that's my little bit on machinery. Thanks for the question, Tom. So that's gonna do it for me tonight. I'm gonna go to bed, but uh, this actually was super productive. Somehow I got way more done today than I did in either of the two previous days. This is all kind of loaded up here for the most part. I can start pulling the chair kits out of the house and getting everything out of the, uh, the office space in there and start getting things further set up back here. So I have my nice little packing station here, all kind of flowing through. It's starting to come together, which is, uh, oh man, it's, 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 it's taking a long time to get to this point, and I'm actually pretty excited. 
Uh, one little thing I thought about for this rack here is what I can do is I can put it in the garage space and do something similar to what I did with the towel handler. I can put the pallet rack over top of where the forklift will park. So the butt of the forklift will go underneath the rack and that'll give me some space basically above that window. So I won't, I won't cover the window with the pallet rack, but the shelving will start just above window height. So I'll see you the, the next time that uh, I'm out here. So this next one here from Patrick is kind of a fun one. I thought I'd just kind of offer a little bit of a different perspective on this one. So this one here is in relation to renting versus owning the building and the idea that as you're paying rent for your business space, at the end of your lease, your landlord's asset has appreciated in value and you have nothing at the end or you're left with nothing. That's not 100% true. <laughs> this is my little, my hot take on this one, I guess. So at the end of your lease period, you are not left with nothing. Your asset, as well as your landlord's asset, has appreciated in value. And likely, your asset has appreciated in value by far more than your landlord's asset. Your asset, of course, being your business. And of course, this is going to vary depending on the type of business you have and operate. But very likely, the return on your business is probably a better return than a real estate holding company. That's just my fun little different perspective to offer you on this one. And I just mentioned this one because I think renting is so like frowned upon in society that I would hate for someone to think that they cannot grow their business because they cannot fathom the idea of renting space and they're missing out on a lot of opportunity to start or grow their business just because they're so fearful of this idea of paying someone else for space. I saw this a lot in the comments. I'm not like necessarily pro renting. I think definitely owning the building and having both sides of the equation is better. But I think generally a lot of the people in the comments are conflating a residential rent and a commercial rent. That commercial rent allows you to actually generate revenue. So as always, just a little different perspective on things. That's all I can offer. <laughs> So another question had to do with the heat and the temperature in the building and what it's like working in a, uh, a building with, you know, in floor radiant heat. So I have the thermostat set to 55, which is kind of borderline, you know, chilly for me, but not as cold as I would think. That's sort of the weird thing about radiant heat is you can expect that the, the temperature in a radiant floor heat space is like five to 10 degrees cooler than a comparable um, forced air type heated space. So for me being out here, it doesn't feel like it's 55. It feels like it's maybe like mid 60s. So I do have to wear a sweatshirt to be comfortable, but I don't feel like it's that cold in here. And that's the biggest thing that I learned when I moved into the garage shop with its radiant heat. I can set the thermostat to be a lot lower than I would if I was in my previous shop with the, um, the ceiling heater in there. I would keep that space around 75 and I would still be cold. In the shop in the garage here, I have the thermostat set to 65 and that feels plenty adequate. I don't feel cold, which is weird because if I had the temperature set like in the house to 65 where we don't have radiant heat, I'd be freezing. It's just a very different way of staying warm. The floor isn't trying to suck all the heat out of your body, which makes it far more comfortable at a much lower temperature. Okay, my hardware station is getting set up, which is, uh, which is cool. Starting to actually look somewhat organized. So next up, I wanna start getting some of the inventory put away. And I do wanna try storing the seats down here on little carts so I can pull them out, pull the seats I need, 
and then you know slide them back. The seats are kind of the biggest, bulkiest, and the heaviest thing. And the closer I can get them to, you know, the box where they're going to go, the better. <laughs> so I have the rest of all the offcuts from the uh, the home edition to uh, to burn up here. I'm just going to throw together some carts out of some scraps. I got some extra casters that have been kicking around for a while that I can use. So a couple of quick carts. We can get some seats stacked and you know, one step closer to being not completely organized, but it's, 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 it's a lot. It's a lot all at once. I'm pretty excited. This is starting to be like somewhat organized and seems like there is some kind of logical setup for this, which is, which is awesome. So the packing area is at least mostly laid out. Um, this is, I think this is going to be like the best thing I've ever done <laughs> or pretty close to that. But at least this area is kind of flowing in the right direction. Still a lot to do, obviously, but it's flowing. The boxes being over here i think it's gonna be so much nicer i need i have to figure out some better way of presenting them and organizing them but at least they're kind of over there in their own kind of space and not intermingled with everything else and potentially getting you know in the way and everything uh, one thing i'm thinking i'm going to do here is i don't really like this shelving unit it's kind of it's pretty flimsy to be honest so i think i'm going to replace this unit here with another one of these a uh, six foot wide one, this one's a five foot. That'll go between the windows and I'll be a 10 footer so I can be up in there, you know, just like this one. So I can have even more space, but I think it's gonna be a lot nicer to have um, inventory laid out on the shelves like I have here than I've got this one down here on the pallet beneath the table, which is kind of okay. It's okay for grabbing like the, the first, the front row of stuff, but like you can't really, it's not comfortable like to reach in here, so I've left that completely open. The uh, rear legs I can pick from the end of the table. But uh, I just like, this just feels a lot more neat and organized to me and, and whatnot. So instead of having one shelf per skew, it'll probably be two or three shelves per skew for the more popular ones, but that's gonna be a lot nicer than trying to like dig through a pallet. I think it's just far more easy and uniform to do that. So I'm gonna move on to something else so we can kind of keep things rolling along here. I have, I think, three things, three major things that I want to accomplish before at least this is done enough, where it's done enough. <laughs> I want to get the, um, let's call it the garage space kind of finished up. So this back corner or front corner over there, I want to get that finalized or at least closer to being set up. So this rack is gonna go over there and then I need to, finish up this area here. I have these beams to install up there and kind of finish up this general corner of junk here. <laughs> and then after that, I will install the last of the lights so I can uh, be done with that as well. So there have been several people asking about the wall covering, if I'm gonna do anything with the walls or just leave the spray foam exposed. So the internal aesthetics of the building is one of the many things that fall into the category of things that can be done later that don't really impact the minimum functionality of the space. So at this point, I've opted to kind of leave them alone and uh, return to that 
sometime in the future. And yes, I understand that would be easier when the building is completely empty, but through the whole process, I didn't really have the opportunity either because the building was full of stuff while they were doing the spray foam anyway. I also had the idea that if I wanted to add more insulation, I can do that at any time after I've experienced this first winter. So that's always an option too. I can add more insulation before adding any kind of wall covering. I don't know if I actually end up doing anything like that, but it's an option I have, you know, nonetheless. So that takes care of this uh, back corner area here. It's all kind of set up. I needed to get uh, a few more decking mesh things for up there and I can have some more space for a couple more pallets up there if I have anything to go up there. But this area is looking pretty good. I think generally <laughs> I need some more just shelving for smaller stuff and that help up quite a bit. As far as big things go, I have this pallet of lumber on the flattener which is a home but that's really it for like the last of the big stuff that used to get kind of put away i guess except this thing i gotta find a spot for this <laughs> and then this racking over here uh this shelf here will give me a spot to put the snowblower when it's not being used in the off season and you know something else however one small detail is this top rack which has all of the maple for the cabinets once the dust collection is installed, I won't be able to actually fork anything up there. So that shelf will be uh, hand-loaded stuff, but it's not too big a deal. It gets more stuff kind of up and out of the way, but yeah, I think I'll put a smaller shelf over here for smaller things and, and whatnot, but we are, we are really getting there. So next, 
I'm going to take care of getting the rest of these lights up and getting them up and used and out of the way because they're sitting here just waiting to get run over by the forklift. Three more lights up and it's already, you know, a little bit brighter back there in the corner. And since I always get questions on lights, here is, uh, here's what I'm using. So these are very similar to the lights that I have in my shop. These are the ones I have in there. These are a two row, uh, eight foot fixture. And the ones out here are a three row. So it gives you a little bit more spread on the light for the, uh, you know, these, these higher ceilings. The two rows that I have in the shop are 72 watts, and these are, I think, 90 watts. I think the two row are like 8,000 lumen, and then these three rows are like 11 or 12,000. The lights on the bottoms of these first two trusses, those are, a, uh, those are all two row LEDs because I have a lot of extra ones of those. I bought a bunch of those for temporary lighting for the renovation, and then the rest of these are all gonna be your three row. I like these because they're quick and cheap and they're skinny so you can put them on the bottom of uh, joists or trusses like this. Uh, I think the three row are like uh, $20 a piece, maybe $22 a piece. And then the, uh, the two row were like, I don't know, 15 or something. In the shop I have 24 eight footers and 11 six foot fixtures. Those are the two row LEDs. And out here I'll have uh, 27 lights, which I'll show you in a little bit. It's, it's Good, but it might not be quite enough for me. So all the lights are installed, and I think for now it's probably going to be good enough, you know, for me. This level of um, luminance is probably what most people would consider a well-lit space. It's a little bit brighter lit than the warehouse space was but uh, it's not quite to the level of the shop. So I thought we'd jump into the camera and I'd do a little correction here so you can see uh, more or less what it looks like in person. So this is currently what I would have the camera set to to record in here, try and brighten things up a little bit, try and bring out some of the shadows so I don't have a whole lot of work to do in editing. If I adjust this picture so it looks more like what it does in real life, it is uh, maybe somewhere around there. That's more of a realistic uh, look at what the current sort of lighting conditions are in real person. And I thought for a little fun comparison, we'll take this camera with these settings here and we'll take it into the shop and we'll see how that compares. So that's the shop. It's a little bit uh, brighter lit in here. And if I adjust this for you know, what I would normally shoot in here, be somewhere kind of in that range would be more or less how I'd have the camera set to shoot in here. But this space is obviously set up for a little bit of a different purpose. This is a basically a film studio that I happen to work in. So having really good lighting for the cameras is really good. But in the years I spent working in this environment, having essentially the entire space is task lit. So working at the bench, doing hand tool work, doing any sort of fine detail work, you have excellent lighting no matter where you go. So I gravitated more towards that years ago to make it easier to film, but then my ability to work in that space also kind of followed. 
I find it so much more easy and pleasant to work now in a space that's lit with uh, this much lighting. That's just me though. Let's, uh, let's walk back to the barn. So a little bit darker here on camera. And of course this will be kind of made worse at night because we do have a good amount of natural light coming into those windows. But that's probably a good comparison of you know, the lighting level in here versus in my shop. So you can see where I might think this might be a little bit on the, uh, the dim side. So future things, I have a lot more of these lights still kicking around that I can uh, put up somewhere as, uh, as needed, probably over top of the, the chair kit area, as that's where I will spend most of my time looking at things. <laughs> and really that's probably where I'm gonna leave this one. I have made a whole heck of a lot of progress here in the last couple of days. It actually feels like a space that might be functional at this point, or at least I don't have to think about making it, you know, functional anymore. It's at least somewhat organized and things are heading in the right direction. I still have a lot of little things to go, but the big hurdles are kind of out of the way. The only real big thing that needs a home right now is this pallet here on the surfacer. And I'll probably stack some of that stuff up there on that shelf up there uh, at some point. So here's kind of a quick look at how things are laid out. I think this is going to work out really nicely. I have, uh, like I said, a lot more to go. I think there's a lot more shelving coming here in my future. A few more shelves in here, around here for all the small stuff. I'm thinking I might put a shelving unit above the spray foam machine, above the boxes to recapture some of that space up in there. But uh, I got my vertical storage slot. <laughs> <laughs> right there and I have way more wood in here now than I uh I probably normally would because I knew I was getting this building to this point or I was, because I knew I was getting this building I had two 40-foot container loads dried uh, beforehand so I have that to kind of work through and uh, get moved out of here and onto people and uh I don't know I like this there's, there's something cool about this where everything's got its own shelf so at least now it feels like I can get back to, uh, to actual work, which feels good in my, in my heart. One little thing on the layout, I think. So I was, the forklift parking here, I don't, think, I don't think it's the best place for it. Since it is used for anything happening over here, I think the forklift will live wherever I leave it in the moment out in the, uh, the open space. And this will be more the area for like the skid steer. I can put the, the snow blower on the shelves and everything. But it's not being used. I can put all the attachments in here if I need to and just kind of make things more organized for it or just store more wood over there or something. But basically the forklift doesn't need to, uh, doesn't need to be there. So that is gonna do it for this one. For, uh, we are moving right ahead, which, oh my goodness, I'm so happy right now. <laughs> just to be at this point where the mental load is, is calming down. It feels, feels quite good. So. Thank you, as always, for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments on the barn, the setup, or what have you, please feel free to leave me a comment. As always, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And until next time, <laughs> happy woodworking. I will be doing some woodworking. I guarantee it. Please.